Hi, welcome to SignalPad. This episode is all about the RFIC IMS Microwave Week Industry Trade Show. Just like last year, I visited the exhibition during the IMS Microwave Week and I went and I talked with some of the vendors looking at their booth and see what they have to offer and talk about some of the latest and greatest stuff that's on display. And what I cover in the video is only a fraction of a fraction of all the vendors that are there. There are over 650 vendors and I can only cover a handful of them. So you can imagine how many amazing things are there. By attending RF RFIC and IMS, you're not only seeing the latest uh, publications and research in ASIC and microwave technology from some of the smartest people in the world, but also the exhibition center itself is one of my favorite parts of the whole conference. So definitely consider uh, coming to the conference next year. I have to check to see what it is. This year it was in Boston. It was a lot of fun, of course. Boston is close to where I live already. But uh, check out the video. I have the link in the description of all the different vendors, and you can also see last year's video as well. It's, it's on my channel, but lots of really cool things to show. Now what I want to ask you is to leave a comment and let me know what other activities you want me to cover during the IMS microwave week. I could do uh, interviews with the people who are doing the plenary. I could do interviews with some of the other authors. I could go to some of the different events that are happening at the same time, which is not just the exhibition. So if you want me to cover something beyond the exhibition, let me know and hopefully we can make that happen for next year. Now let's go and take a look what's there. So here I am at the Roden Shores booth and I want to show you a brand new instrument they have. This is a ZNBT series net vector network analyzers. As you can see, this can go up to 24 ports and 40 gigahertz. Now, normally in the old days, I should say, a multi-port network analyzer was only used for people who were designing backplane because they wanted to see the re response of various channels and the interface between the channels and how much crosstalk there is. But nowadays in the 5G era, a lot of people are interested in figuring out how these 5G chipsets, different uh, phase data components are actually working so having a multi-port uh, network analyzer like this allows you to directly connect to a device under test, which is a beamformer. So this is an RF beamformer operating at you know, 28 gigahertz, 39 gigahertz, or whatever it may be. And because this unit runs Windows, you're able to basically load the configuration file of any phase array in there and synchronize the phase array measurement directly with the network analyzer itself. So you can go ahead and run S parameters, you can run attenuation, phase shifter characteristics, you can get a complete idea on how an RF in, RF out, multi-port phase array system works using a vector network analyzer, which is a completely different way of thinking about vector network analysis nowadays. So having this whole synchronized script-driven multi-port uh, network analyzer is going to simplify the testing and characterization of these devices significantly going forward. So I'm going to show you how it works actually on the computer and see how fast it runs all these basically almost a hundred different S parameter measurements and characterization of phase shifters directly on the unit itself. So let's go ahead and try run a test here on this uh, beamformer from IDT. I'm going to run a test. So there's a script that's written there. And it's going to start doing some characterization initially, basically measuring S parameters. But on the next setup, it's going to measure all the different combination of S parameters for all the inputs. I mean, look at that. That's that is crazy. And then it just goes through. Now it's measuring all the attenuation states, and it's going to go to the next screen, which would eventually measure the phase shifter settings. So basically, with the push of a button for the full script, you get a complete characterization of RF in, RF port out on up to 24 port phase array chipsets in a single setup, which is, uh, which is amazing. Now just imagine how much this would normally take to do if you weren't using an instrument like this with a built-in script. So let me show you the Rodin Shores brand new ZNA vector network analyzer. This is their top of the line network analyzer unit with some of the world record dynamic range you can get. But this is more than just a network analyzer. This is basically an all-in-one instrument. And you can see that different kind of vendors are all moving towards being able to build a single box that can do all of your tests in one setup. Because the most of the time is in how you set things up initially and then you want to run as many tests as you can. And this machine really is an all-in-one. So here we are seeing the conversion of this particular satellite block down converter, which is normal. That's how you, you would normally measure return loss and S21 and S11 and so on. But then under different tabs, you can do completely different measurements, which traditionally require multiple instruments at the same time. Here we are measuring phase linearity of the phase and phase deviation. These are quite difficult measurements to make in an S parameter setup. But then once you do your linear measurements, then you can enter all the nonlinear measurements. You can do intermodulation. You can get OIP3 and IM3 terms directly from the unit. Remember, I'm not changing anything. Everything 
these are already connected, and all I'm doing is just going between different tabs on a live measurement on the unit itself. You can then do compression tests. You can see the P1 dB. You can see the nature of the compression across frequency. You can see how fast it compresses. You can compare P1 dB to PSAT across different uh, operations of the device itself. And of course, you can look at different kinds of tones out of spurs that you don't want in your man because there's a full spectrum analyzer capability already built into it as well. I also like the design of this. It's a little bit different way of thinking. They've got a du dual LCD here, but the second LCD is a dynamic screen which changes depending on what you're measuring. So you basically have a, a contextual interface to the instrument's measurement depending on what you're doing, so then it continuously changes. It's a very capable instrument. Uh, you can basically do all in one, and there's a ton of things you can do. I'm only really scratching the surface, and maybe one day we'll get a hold of one of these and do some proper tests uh, in the lab ourselves as well. But very cool instrument. Definitely check it out. So two other instruments I wanted to show you. This is the Rodenschwarz FSWP. This is a 50 gigahertz phase noise analyzer. Again, one of the best in the industry. This one does all the things you would expect from a phase noise analyzer, such as cross-correlation, cancellation. This one works, again, as I said, up to 50 gigahertz, but it's having some of the uh, amazing phase noise performance. But what is connected to here is something that I'm pretty excited about. This instrument over here is the brand new SMA100B. This is uh, Roden Schwartz's first 67 gigahertz synthesizer, and even maybe more, depending on how they would eventually spec it. This is just released now. And one of the things that is uh, different about this one is that it, there is no compromise between output power, phase noise, and performance. Th this thing can do about 18 dBm up to 67 gigahertz, which is a lot of power at that frequency. And its, frequ and its phase noise continues to get better at lower frequencies. Uh, the architecture internally is a little bit different from some of their competitors. And as you go lower and lower in frequency, the phase noise continues to get better. So you can use this thing at 100 megahertz and get record performance, and at 67 gigahertz and get record phase noise. So these two brand new instruments, again, from uh, from Roland Shores, they continue to push the envelope, and they have a lot of really neat stuff here. So let me tell you a little bit about OTA measurement solutions from, uh, from Roden Shores. So over-the-air measurements is quite difficult, simply because as the aperture size of your device and the test grows, being in a far field becomes harder and harder. So one of the ways to get around that is to do your measurements in near field and do a near field to far field translation. That's a challenging thing because there's a lot of computation that needs to go into that. But more importantly, you're going to need a vector network analyzer that has sufficient dynamic range and phase stability in order to be able to do an accurate near field to far field translation. And that's what this system is essentially doing. You're able to uh, apply the source directly to the device under test and look at the return signal from uh, another antenna in both polarization, get all that information, and the Roden Shore software will take that, take it in the near field consideration, and give you a far field pattern of your device. This is a pretty challenging thing, as I said. You need very good instrument and good software to work together to make this happen. But at the same time, they want to do more than that. They want to be able to measure different kinds of EVM performance of devices. Now these are active, and you don't have the phase information like you would traditionally do with a vector network analyzer. What you have to do is now something completely different. You have to essentially emulate far field behavior in a chamber that's the size of a near field test system. So for that, they have a couple of different solutions. I'm going to show you inside one of these chambers in just a second. What we have here is a parabolic antenna right here. At the very top of the chamber, this chamber is no bigger than a regular near field chamber, and that provides a parallel field that the waves come down on your device under test, and that is essentially what a far field view would look like. This emulation of the far field allows them to now use some of their vector instruments to do EVM measurements directly on the device as if it were being radiated from the far field, even though it's in a small antenna chamber. So the combination is really powerful and gives you a full solution of software and hardware in reasonable package sizes to give you a complete characterization. We can also go around the corner so you can take a look at inside one of these OTA units, and these are a very interesting and, again, important devices for future of 5G and 6G testing. So here's what's inside the ATS-1000 series um, OTA measurement system. So as you can see, we have our device under test over here, and we have an arm that does a 360 rotation around to capture the proper radiation pattern of this. Now, this is a difficult thing because you need to have some kind of a hardware synchronization to the device that's doing this measurement, which means that you, not, you need not only to have high precision on measurement of the device and exact angles, you also need to be able to rapidly synchronize this, otherwise this test is going to take forever. So they do, what they do is that they do a full rotation, fully in synchronous with the network analyzer, and then they step the, uh, the other antenna, which is the source, or in this case, whichever way is the, the device and the test and the source. And they do this basically as fast as it is possible, having direct link between the hardware and the software inside the test unit to be able to do this as quickly as possible so that you can reduce your test time. And another nice feature is that there's, of course, 
lasers built into, the, into this chamber itself, and this is used for alignment because you, it's very difficult to tell and judge distances inside an OTA system like this because of the absorbers. It's hard to tell how far things are actually from each other. So it's like, almost like an optical illusion. So these uh, lasers sitting everywhere allows you to align things, which is very important. It gives you absolute uh, reference of position so that you know your measurements are correct. And here I'm at the Keysight booth, and finally the Field Fox Microwave Analyzer B versions have been rolled out. These instruments have now received upgrades essentially across the board. We have much lower displayed average noise level now on these instruments at 2 gigahertz. Phase noise is improved at a minus 117 dBc per hertz at a 10 kilohertz offset, which can make a really big difference in characterization. But perhaps some of the most important additions is that now we have a proper real-time uh, signal analyzer built into this. We have 100 megahertz of analysis bandwidth and a full second of capture, that's two, of, that's two gig of memory, on basically something that you portably carry around. Much higher battery now in there, so that obviously the battery life will be much higher. And what they've also done is that if you want to work in a 5G, 24 gigahertz to 30 gigahertz range, you don't necessarily have to buy the, you know, the 50 gigahertz version of this instrument. You can buy a much lower frequency. As I explained, these are compatible with the OML extenders, allowing you to take advantage of the real-time spectrum analysis directly from the mixer that the OMLs makes, plugging into their seamless connectivity through the USB, and the instrument configures the extender to operate in the range you want. There's a couple of other additions of software built into this. You can do a uh, tracking of different cell towers and do the modulations of, the, of uh, some of the carrier signals to figure out what is actually happening in the background. I'm going to show you that in just a second. The, the field force microwave analyzer series in general are essentially industry leading because of the portability capability. And with the new advantages that they've done there with uh, the re reduction of noise floor and of course improved phase noise, it becomes closer and closer to a bench top instrument, except that, well, it's not. It's a, it's a portable unit you can take around with you. So I'm I'm going to show you a few of the software features there, but this is probably the most dynamic, most capable, portable instrument in the world right now, and, and it can operate in several different modes. Definitely check out the B version. A ton of new engineering has gone into these units. So here's another example of the flexibility of the Field Fox Microwave Analyzer. Uh, if you have a phased array module like this Anoki Wave one here, which can be configured directly from the unit itself, what you can do is you can do over-the-air measurement and actually get the beam pattern directly on the unit itself. You can send a CW waveform with a horn antenna where the direction is known, and then you can sweep the phase on the receive side and plot a polar plot so you can see the radiation pattern, all from the single unit. And you can see the control of the phased array itself coming through the Ethernet port uh, if your module supports that. With a closed-loop software, you can do this on the field. You don't need uh, all the instruments and software and the PC and everything with you. You just do that directly there, get the radiation pattern for alignment and checking to see if things are actually working on the field. So these instruments continue to get more and more powerful, uh, essentially replacing what would have been a wide range of instruments connected together with a single box. And here's the example of doing the modulation uh, signals directly from the tower itself. So right now it's on the LTE from Verizon, and you can see it can capture different uh, channels that are coming in and doing the modulation. 5G TF and 5G NR support will also be there, and some of them is already built in the instrument, which means that the essentially the, all the configuration required for you to do the measurement on the field is there, so you don't have to fill around, figure out the settings. It will do everything on the fly, and you will know exactly what's going on on the field. And as with all the other software packages and all the other uh, different capabilities these instruments have, you can have a nice single instrument solution. So continuing at the Keysight booth here, we finally have the replacement of the phase noise system that's been around on the market for a very long time from Keysight. Now this particular PXI unit is going to have a performance from 50 kilohertz all the way up to 40 gigahertz. Now the way these instruments work is by doing cross-correlation cancellation between multiple LO sources to extract the phase noise of the signal you're interested in, essentially almost to the noise, the thermal noise of the instrument itself. So one of the key features of this is that it gives you complete flexibility for using external LO signals directly on this. So you're not limited by any built-in synthesizers. You simply take two sources. For example, here they're using PSGs. Obviously, you don't have to do that. If you have a cleaner source or a different source, you can feed that into this. And then you have another source that goes in, which is the source you want to measure. The instrument will do mixing and con down conversion and digital co uh, correlation cancellation, does a whole bunch of computation directly on the FPGA. There's no CPU involved here. Everything is in hardware. And then you get uh, the correlation cancellation, and you get the ultimate uh, noise floor of the device you're measuring. So if you have an extremely clean crystal or a DRO or some kind of an oscillator that has you know, noise reaching minus 183, minus 190 dB 
as DBC per Hertz, you would be able to measure with this. In fact, if you have enough correlation terms, you can see this is the ultimate performance of the unit itself. It goes all the way down to minus 196 dBc per That's thermal noise at this point, which is very impressive. So this is a big announcement from Keysight because this is a finally an upgrade to the system that's been around for a very long time. And if you want to characterize extremely clean synthesizers up to 40 gigahertz with flexible LO inputs, this is the choice to go. And finally, we have a major release of software from Keysight. So Pathway Design Software is a, a collaborative effort across many of the softwares that Keysight has to offer. So as you know, Keysight has Golden Gate, ADS, and a variety of test and measurement softwares that all work independently and can do a lot of different things. But what they are doing finally is that they are creating from design to measurement platform. So you would be able to do simulation of your RFIC devices, and then you would be able to go all the way to manufacturing, testing, packaging, board design, simulation of all of that, and then ultimately to software and then test and measurement. And you would be able to do correlation of all these measurements and all these different data that you're creating from your design all together under one umbrella. This is a, a major move, of course, and a, and a logical one for Keysight, because they have so many things happening and so many softwares that, that is going on at the same time. And once you combine all these design and all these software platforms together to have a genuine flow from design all the way to testing, and that's going to be the major differentiator. Combining it with their test equipment, a software package like this that covers everything from simulation of devices to measurement of systems is, is, is just a, an industry changing thing. So now the idea is how is that all going to come together and how is this flow going to work? This is something that they're working on. And definitely check out Pathwave on their website so you can get an idea of what, what they can do. There's a lot to absorb here. And here I am at the John Gorsha booth, and they have quite a few new cable assemblies that they offer with really good phase stability. So as you can imagine, uh, when you're dealing with very high number of IOs and you want to connect them to a multi-port network analyzer, the profile of the connector is really important. Otherwise, you won't have the density to, to be able to get signals in and out. Traditionally, these type of connectors with very low profile for dense IOs uh, are not very phase stable. And John Kosha has done some nice work in this domain and have uh, allowed this basically to become as phase stable as the traditional cables that you would be using in a network analyzer setup. So for instance, here they have a setup where they're showing a live S-parameter measurement of a cable between the two ports of this Keysight Firefox. And in fact, as you bend the cable, as you move the cable around, you can see the phase stability is really quite excellent. If you've ever done any S-parameter measurements and have moved cables around, you would see that doing something like this to a cable under S-parameter test is just an absolute no-no. But you can see it's really quite good. A few degrees of shift when you completely bend the cable on such a long cable in a setup like this is quite impressive. They also have another setup with actual metrology connectors connected to a uh, PNAX, which you're going to take a look at. But it's very nice to see these low-profile, high-density connectors are being available at phase stable cables too. So here's a good example of this setup that I was referring to. So here they have a little motorized uh, section which is constantly bending these cables up and down. And this is running continuously over a long time. And they're again measuring live as parameters here on this PNAX. And this has been running you know, for days now. And you can see that at the very, very bottom where the phase, that's the five degree per division. And the phase, of course, is going to shift at 50 gigahertz. But how much it shifts is very, very little, allowing for excellent performance. You can see the loss of the cable over here in this huge setup. Uh, we have about 11.9 dB of loss for the entire cable section. And you can see there's a lot of cables here. So this phase stability is obviously critical in, in characterizations of systems and devices. And the more we get into component characterization, you want to remove any uncertainty from your measurement setup. And this is one way to do it, to remove the phase uh, dependence of the cable's location. And you do a very good job. They also have one other really cool product that's brand new to the market I'm going to show you. And here is their brand new 145 gigahertz 0.8 millimeter cable and connector assembly. These are, I believe, the world's only flexible cable assembly that supports 0.8 millimeter connectors in the end and goes up to 145 gigahertz. And their one gigahertz, or their one millimeter version, supports 130 gigahertz. So these are basically the only kind of cables, aside from one Ritsu, with these connectors you can buy to be able to do coaxial measurements up to 145 gig, which you can imagine is very beneficial because, you know, waveguide flexible waveguides are quite hard to use, but this can essentially be almost a D-band, at least in the, up until the summer, in the middle of the D-band, all the way in coax. So it's really quite incredible, and having them, of course, being 
flexible like this is a huge advantage. Unfortunately, they don't have S parameters live measuring this right now, but we can imagine the data sheet is going to be accurate as a good, a good thing to look at. So for optical applications, for connecting to remote heads like this, uh, these are critical. So I'm very happy to see that finally, there's somebody who actually has 145 gigahertz coax cables that we can easily go and buy. So I'm here at Amphenol, and of course everybody's heard about them. So they're doing a lot of custom connector design. So pretty much a lot of the backplane products you see are going to be using their products. Now they can do pretty much any combination that you would want. Highly customizable connectors for backplane interfaces. They have a couple of new things here that I want to cover that I thought is most interesting. If you look at this board over here, despite the fact that you may need to go in a 90 degree angle and bring signals in and out of a backplane board like this one, typically what users do is that they put a connector here to go in a different direction and another connector to go yet again in a different direction. Now that interface, aside from having difficulty with high frequency because of the connectors, is also quite a bit uh, space requirements are needed to accomplish that. So in, a, in military applications where you don't have any room to add anything or weight is a big concern, these flex connectors, these ribbons that you see that are basically built in directly to the PCB can be used to bend the signal around a corner. And even though these are these look fairly uh, bulky, they actually can be rated all the way up to 25 gigahertz. So you can do 25 gigabit per second, quite a few lanes passing across a high-speed backplane in a really constrained space. And, and this is, you can see, it's built from the same, essentially, mask. And passing DC, RF, uh, digital IOs, and so on across a very complex backplane structure. They do have a really a wide range of products. They're not limited to this, of course. They can do uh, different kinds of lamination, plating, PCB. You can see here's a, a PCB to PCB interface with a similar idea. Now you have two PCBs that can be bent in an angle and have high-speed signals going through them with many, many components on each side. But this can be built in, in one piece. And you can imagine the, the cost saving and the space saving for something like this to make it happen. So overall, really cool products. and. Hopefully Hopefully we can find some of these in the next generation of consumer products as well. And here I'm at, at Pico Probes. I've actually been using these guys for over a decade. So they have probably some of the most customizable probe solutions in the industry. They'll work with you, make you any kind of configuration you want. There's a sample here, a variety of things they can do. They have probes, which are waveguide, of course, going all the way up to a terahertz. Uh, they can customize some of these interfaces. As you can imagine, making a 1100 gigahertz probe is, is quite difficult. Some of the other ones that I really like that I didn't know actually exist is that they can do composite probes up to 140 gigahertz. So you can have a solution of mix of DC and coax interfaces up to 130, and of course, waveguide interfaces. This can be a huge time save and cost saving solutions when you have a complex RFIC SOC that you want to test. They make very high power probes now uh, for testing GAN devices, you know, up to maybe over 100. Uh, watts of power can be delivered through here. They have some unusual interfaces, like these ones. They can reach underneath a package and test something directly interfacing inside a very difficult to reach area. This can again be very important. You don't have to disassemble your package when you want to do testing. Other kinds of waveguide interface probes are available. Non-magnetic material probes are available, which is all the way over there. Non-magnetic stuff can be very useful in a cryogenic environment or in an environment where you have a radiation you don't want to block and reflect back with the probe body itself. Of course, customizable, fully customizable as well, probe cars are also available. Probably one of the best uh, industry supports you would be able to get from these guys and be able to build pretty much anything you want. Uh, these guys are industry leaders. Definitely check them out. Pico Probes, definitely one of my favorite. And here I am on the Andrisu booth. I'm going to show you something really crazy. So this instrument here is a essentially almost from DC, from 70 gigahertz to 220 gigahertz single sweep network analyzer. So Anrisu has a long history of going beyond 110 gigahertz in single sweep. They used to have the 0.8 millimeter. They pioneered the 0.8 millimeter connector on those tiny modules that go directly on the probe to go beyond 110. They used to go to about 145 gigahertz. The issue was that going beyond 145 gigahertz meant going smaller than 0.8 millimeter. And the connection, making that kind of connector is just insane. I mean, even making the 0.8 millimeter connector is very difficult. So if they want to do a single sweep 70 kilohertz to 220 gigahertz, they had to come up with a new solution to support that kind of transition. And what they created here, I'm going to have to be very careful with this one. This is one of the very few in the world that actually is there. They created a waveguide alignment to a coaxial interface. 
that has this tiny, tiny little hole. This is actually a coax connector, even though it looks like a waveguide interface. That's why it can go down to 70 kilohertz. So BiasDs and IF and the low signals and control signals from the network analyzer are all built into this module, going to 220 gigahertz in a single sweep on a probe station, which is just uh, absolute craziness. So this whole module, this whole system here, of course, is on resource pioneer. This going to 220 is all available, can be hopefully purchased soon. Connects to the regular network analyzer in the back, bringing the interface of the probe very close to the head is of course very important because that reduces the losses of the interface between the remote head to your device under test. So your characterization up to 220 gigahertz gets the maximum dynamic range you could get from the heads, which is the, of course, what you want to maintain making these measurements. Overall, an, an impressive engineering uh, feast by uh, here by Anrisu. Incredible. I can't wait to see this in action some point. So continuing here on Ritsu, the technology I just showed you with the 220 gigahertz DAN conversion front end for the network analyzer can of course be translated to build a standalone network analyzer as well. And this is exactly what they've done. This particular unit is the world's smallest and probably only seven, uh, it's a nine kilohertz to 110 gigahertz spectrum analyzer. This is based on nonlinear transmission line down conversion. There's a very interesting paper on that written by Anritsu, but it's the same front end technology used in the network analyzers. The advantage of something like this is that of course it's USB powered, controlled by the computer, and you have a single sweep 9 kilohertz to 110 gigahertz front end built into this. So you can have this on the field connected to a laptop or just use it as a test instrument. Furthermore, you can take the same thing and put it into a power detector module instead. And now you have banded power detection. So you can say, I want to integrate power between a certain you know, 10 or 20 gigahertz, whatever it may be in the entire band, and it will do a power integration. And then you can use this to do power leveling of the network analyzer, so you can do a power cal directly using these instruments. So for the time being, this is the only 9 kilohertz to 110 gigahertz portable spectrum analyzer. Now, the dynamic range of an instrument like this is not going to compete with the dynamic range of a full-fledged spectrum analyzer, but for maybe you know, 90 or 95% of the use cases, you may not care about that, and this can solve a ton of problems in the lab. So I'm eager, hopefully, I can get a, access to one of these one day and, and take a look at it in the lab and see how it works, but for now, this is a pretty impressive instrument. So here are uh, several different technologies combined together. This is the Anrisu Vector Network Analyzer. This is a shock line product. And the advantage of these is that when you want to do measurement in E-band, typically, it's very difficult to get away from the network analyzer itself because you have to have a way of getting the signals, of course, from the main box. And this shock line Anrisu Network Analyzer come with a five meter tether, which then ultimately connect to these little remote heads. And this particular remote here is an E-band one. And that way it allows you to bring your remote head directly at where your port is that you're interested in measuring. In this case, it's connected to a horn antenna, again, increasing the dynamic range because the E-band signal is only generated at this interface. What is cool here is that at the same time, Diamond Engineering has this uh, little uh, dynamic setup going on here where they have a motorized interface between the network analyzer head going through a, a spinning module which allows you to rotate the network analyzer head and the horn antenna in orientation you want. And therefore you can do measurements between these two horn antennas at essentially all different kinds of polarizations and angles. And that gives you the opportunity to fully characterize a link over the air. So imagine if you are, let's say, an automotive radar developer and you want to find out what happens to different polarization angles or different rotations uh, between the two radar modules you have. Well, you can mount them on directly on these E-band transceiver modules and do a full characterization of the link directly there and find out exactly what happens at different angles. So it's a very flexible and dynamic set of technologies combined here, of course, taking advantage of the shock line network canal as the features of Anritsu to make something like this happen. So I'm eager to see uh, what kind of other measurements you can do. But this, is, of course, doesn't end only here. We're using horn antennas. You can imagine a full phase array transceiver at the other end, and you can do S parameters over the air and look at the different angles and polarization, losses, fading. A lot of cool things can come out of a setup like this. I've never actually seen a, an adjustable waveguide interface like this, so I'm going to have to check it out later. So let me tell you a little bit more about dynamic engineering, diamond engineering as well here. So they actually have their own software. And this software is not uniquely connected to Anritsu per se. They have a wide range of support, of course. And this means that this whole solution that I give you in the software that allow you to do this characterization can be connected to any network analyzer system you already have. It's just that it's nice to see it connected to Anritsu in this particular case because of the interesting remote heads and the, the wide dynamic range system going on. But definitely check out their software because if you have an existing solution, you can just add that on top of what you already have without having to change your network analyzer.
So here I'm in Microchip booth and I want to show you one of their latest products here. So here you have two transistors that are mounted on this heatsink. What is interesting is that these are GAN and silicon carbide devices capable of delivering a combined 1500 watts of power at 1050 and 1090 frequencies for avionic uh, defense. Now this whole setup is live, of course, I can't really bring my finger too close to it, but some of the advantages of this is that it's unusual to find GAN and silicon carbide in a fully packaged uh, offering like this, where you can apply a traditional reflow that you would do from any package device. There's a heat slug that's underneath here, so the energy density offered here on these GAN and silicon carbide devices is very, very high, and this competes very favorably with LDMOS devices which have inferior uh, performance from that point of view. So even though the power output of the system is comparable, the packaging, the power density, the thermal solution, and the ease of use for industrialization really are some of the strengths of this. So if I move the camera over here, I can see that setup is actually running live. And you can see all the way up there that indeed we have 1.5 kilowatt. There it is, of power coming out from this uh, module live right now running. So very amazing to see so much power. This is the reason why this massive heat sink is here is because that's they need to dissipate 1,500 watts of power somewhere. The power supply of the system is 50 volts. So very interesting to see. There's a couple of other cool things at Microchip that I want to show you. Let's go take a look. And here we have another product from Microchip. This particular one is a DC to 24 gigahertz broadband amplifier uh, with a couple of interesting features that are worth mentioning. It comes at several different power configurations and maximum powers, but it has 14 dB of gain along with a gain slope that's built into the response of the amplifier itself. So instead of the amplifier having a, a slope that continuously degrades, it actually has an upslope, so-called, so it has a 2 dB peaking at higher frequencies. That allows you to combine this with the response of something else that has the opposite direction to create a much more flat response. That means that you don't have to essentially worry so much about the response of your package or the response of your traces, you're pre-equalizing the entire system built into the amplifier itself. Now having also a very high OIP3, 35 dBm at 10 gigahertz, it also comes with dynamic bias adjustment, meaning that you can change the bias depending on your needs of changing OIP3 or power consumption, allowing you to optimize the design on the fly after essentially it's been made. So having these kind of features built into the, a, a very small package with the kind of power we have and the pre-equalized frequency response will ease design in the future. So here I want to show you a really unique product. So this saw oscillator is also from Microchip, and here they have it in a setup so it can show us what kind of performance it offers. Uh, they, they, this can be built in various different frequencies up to above 2 gigahertz, but this one is operating at 600 megahertz. And they have it in this jig, and this jig has to be put together very carefully. There's actually three of these in here, simply because there is no test instrument that has a signal clean enough to be able to test it. So they're going to have to use and a low frequency generated by these crystals and do some decorrelation algorithm to find what the actual phase noise of these saw oscillators are. So these numbers are just out of this world. We're talking about phase noise of minus 160 dBc per hertz at a 10 kilohertz offset and a floor of better than 183 dBm per hertz. These are just crazy numbers that to, to see from an oscillator. Aside from that, this thing can work from minus 40 degrees Celsius to 85 degrees Celsius. It has a built-in a surface oven that sits very close to the actual saw oscillator itself, it reducing the thermal uh, mass of the whole unit and the, the whole oven. It's, it's just crazy. These numbers are, are quite incredible to see on something running live. These are real numbers. And this thing puts out 18 dBm of power, which is, of course, important if you want to maintain and that the kind of dynamic range you would want from these kind of oscillators. Definitely check them out. Some of the cleanest oscillators I think I've ever seen. So let me show you something really interesting from Maycom. So this panel you see here is a large phase array operating in the S-band around 3 gigahertz. Each of these modules are TR modules operating at both transmit and receive, going into dual polarization antennas. What you're seeing is the back of the board where all the heat sinks are. On the other side are where the antennas are. This is a very complex hybrid PCB layer, including Tyser layers in between Rogers layers to distribute power to different antennas. Each of these ICs can do a peak power of 8 watts, 10% duty cycles, the pulse radar on each of the polarizations. What's nice is that this is a scalable module, so you can just make this panel larger and larger and larger. And Maycom has done uh, different kinds of projects with MIT, being able to create a large array and actually do weather forecasting, and of course this can be used for military application, but the primary application is for weather. What I really like about this is that it looks deceptively simple, but there's a lot of stuff that's gone into this. These gas amplifiers, of course, are TR modules, have to be individually designed, the thermal has to be designed, the DC, all the distribution, the tyser layers, the antennas on the other side, and eventually they look like little modules like that. 
You can see that's the 64 element, uh, which is the back of this board exactly. So the whole thing includes the antennas as well. And this thing can put out a ton of power. Just imagine having these, you know, tens of these panels at 8 watt peak power on po both polarizations. A really beautiful, massive system and fully scalable. Really nice work from Meka. So here I'm at OML, and if you're familiar with the products, they basically make frequency extensions on any kind of network analyzer. They go all the way up to 500 a gigahertz. They can do spectrum analyzer interfaces. What they have here that is new is that what they've built is essentially uh, for the 5G applications, a 24 to 40 gigahertz down conversion module that directly connects to a network analyzer. And this allows you to interface a low frequency network analyzer to a TR module and do measurements in the 5G bands, which is of course of interest. This would mean that you don't have to necessarily upgrade your network analyzers and buy yourself a 40 gigahertz network analyzer if you just want to start working in the 5G bands. allows you to basically upgrade your network analyzers with this extender that's directly connected to it. Here there's a setup between two Keysight uh, Field Fox microwave analyzers, which are both spectrum analyzer and network analyzer. Signal is being transmitted from one module using one of their own, again, multiplier, and then received, and you can see the tone moving around. You can take this directly connected to an oscilloscope and get a real-time signal coming out because the entire frequency band is available to you. These are fairly broadband modules. Essentially a low-cost, flexible solution to upgrade your existing network analyzers to much higher frequencies. This is also compatible with the Andrisu uh, Sightmaster units as well, but here you can see a nice uh, combination of the Keysight Field Flux and these. Definitely check out the OML products. Of course, if you've been working up to 500 gigahertz, you would definitely know them, but this new product can be a very nice cost-saving solution uh, addition to low-frequency network analyzers. So I'm here at Microsang, and I want to show you something really different in terms of how thermal imaging is done. So this is done based on, uh, based on thermal reflectance, which is a property, is a physical property of material that means that depending on the temperature, surface temperature of a material, the amount of light reflected back from the surface of the material is going to be different. It means that you can draw a correlation between the temperature, surface temperature of whatever you're looking at, and how much light is reflected back off of it when you shine something on it. So here you can see green light being shining directly on top of the surface of a mimic module. Now, why is this such a good idea and such a revolutionary idea? Because it, ha it allows you for several things. You don't need a thermal imaging system that is designed to operate at several micrometers. You are operating in visible light, which means all of your microscope devices and components are operating in visible light. You can see right through them uh, as you would normally do with any microscope. So what they do on top of that is that they correlate the shining of this light with a lock-in amplifier that they have designed connected to a camera up here, and everything here is synchronized together. And this allows you to be able to do frames as small as a nanosecond. So you can capture rates so high that you can see the flow of heat due to the flow of electrons in a mimic with the resolution you would expect to see from an optical instrument, which is absolutely crazy. So here's an example of that. You can see here directly under the microscope, we are looking at a picture of the mimic, and here we are seeing the thermal image at the resolution of the optics, and you can capture this at you know, sub one nanosecond rates and actually see the flow of electrons and the flow of heat through the system. And this is going to be incredible. Of course, there's a lot of things in the background that needs to be done that they have done in advance. They need to calibrate this whole system, and but this is all done. So all you have to do is just point it at what you want to look, and then measure. And this thing has a sensitivity of a few millikelvins, which is itself is pretty incredible. So you can see tiny changes in temperature. So for mimic design and for next generation ICs where you want to see how your power amplifiers are behaving, exactly what is the thermal profile of something, you can just look at it under the microscope and get a thermal profile. A really interesting technology uh, from Microsange, which I hope that you would check out. So here I'm at the Pyconix booth. They have a, a long history of creating miniaturized inductors, and I've actually used them in, in a couple of projects I've been working on. Now these things are absolutely tiny and, and hard to see, but what is incredible is that because of the fact that they're shaped like a cone, you can see an example here, this cone allows you to create a steady 
shift in the resonance frequency of the component you're working on. So if you fill that with iron powder or something lossy like that, you can get some crazy broadband response. I mean, these inductors work from DC to 67 gigahertz. They're surface mount. They can be as small as 60 mils on a PCB. So with this kind of performance, you can imagine them showing up in applications above 65 gigahertz even where you need to have DC chokes and, or some strange odd matching network or you need to pass DC to some difficult to reach places at the lowest amount of loss with the least impact and the circuits you're designing. For example, for a PA, a, a inductor like this at the output can directly reduce the output power and efficiency of the PA. So this flat response low loss is critical. So definitely check them out. There's a lot of really interesting components they have at very different form factors and interesting assembly procedures compatible with a variety of PCB technologies and packages. So definitely check them out. A lot of really cool stuff here. So here I'm at Zhong Hong Electronics, and I want to show you a couple of interesting antenna designs they have here for uh, various applications. So this particular antenna, you can see, it has two feed points, but it has the built-in coupler directly at the back with a single coax interface. This allows them to have a much wider bandwidth from a single antenna because the signals from the two entry points into the patch get combined a single a coupler here, so it gives you a very nice broadband response. This particular design they have is, is very interesting because it has two stacked antennas. This allows you to have, again, a, wide, a much, much wider frequency coverage. For example, you can have GPS L1, L2 combined onto a single wire, and this would give you much better precision, of course, when you're dealing with GPS uh, of, uh, combining different uh, frequencies at the same time. They also have a wide range of filters, all sub-6 gigahertz. You can see different kind of surface mount components, uh, different kind of filter designs, and I'm sure they can do some custom work. They have uh, a lot of different of these modules available here. So this kind of uh, com combined bandwidth or broad bandwidth uh, GPS and sub-6 uh, gigahertz antennas are going to be critical in the sub-6 gig 5G application in the future. So definitely check them out and see what kind of filter designs and antenna designs they have to offer. So here I'm at Witwave, a, a Korean manufacturer of RF cables and connectors, and they have a couple of interesting, innovative solutions. So these are different kinds of interfaces directly to PCBs. These are 67 uh, rated uh, components here. You can see that you have those two versions of them, one version with a socket directly on the PCB, which gets mounted, and it gives you nice uh, alignment for that. Or if you want to avoid that part altogether, they have a version which interfaces directly to the PCB, and again, you can see it gets screwed on the other side. So these devices work up to all the way up to 67 gigahertz. They also have various end launchers and various components that are compatible with Southwest interfaces, of course, that which means that you can replace them. These would probably cost quite a bit less, and these also are rated all the way up to 67 gigahertz. They have a lot of different kinds of products here, and they even make cables all the way up to 110 gigahertz. And uh, I'm not sure about the pricing of these, but of course, 110 gigahertz devices, uh, components like this are primarily limited by the cost of the connectors themselves. And another product they have here, uh, I should say another two products they have here. They have RF absorbers all the way up to 40 gigahertz, but they also have these ECAL modules, which are compatible with uh, Keyside, Roden Schwartz, and Andreas to Shockwave, as well as Copper Mountain PNAs. These guys work all the way up to 26 and a half gigahertz. ECAL modules controllable through USB and Ethernet. So if you connect them to those devices, they essentially communicate with them natively, and then you can do e-calibration. These things would cost quite a bit less than what you would be able to get from directly from those vendors. So it's a worthwhile solution to take a look at. Maybe we'll get some of these in the lab and actually characterize them and compare the performance of an ECAL module, which means that the, the performance of your calibration is going to be a function of how well this is uh, modeled and characterized. But lots of lots of products from this Korean company uh, worth checking out, especially if you're working in millimeter wave frequencies. So here I'm at Swin Booth, and there's another Spectrum Analyzer competitive with some of the entry point instruments you can find. There's quite a few of these now in the market. It's nice to see more competitive products from, from China as well. So this is the SA9275, 7.5 gigahertz Spectrum Analyzer with a tracking generator built in, so you can do all the traditional loss and different kinds of measurements on here. Uh, this thing has an average noise level of minus 160 dBm, which is per, per hertz, which is really competitive with what is available in these frequency ranges. I generally really like the 7.5 gigahertz spectrum analyzers, and then it's funny because Keysights and some of the other competitors don't make 7.5 gigahertz sweeps. You can find them from Regal, but Swin is another one. Having 7.5 gigahertz gives you option to see the third harmonics and 2.4 gigahertz systems, which can sometimes be useful to see ca antenna characteristics and behaviors. So yet another interesting little tiny module you can uh, play around with. I, I like this one. 
And here's another product from them. So they do have these synthesizers that do arbitrary waveform generation on top of a carrier. So they're combining techniques of doing DDS, digital, uh, synth digi direct digital synthesis, as well as, of course, PLL techniques to get the carrier frequency they're looking for. Some of the other uh, nice uh, features here is that they go down to minus 105 dBm or so, and all the way up to 10 dBm. So even in this tiny form factor, that's a fairly large dynamic range. I don't know if they have planned to extending the frequency beyond 1.5 gigahertz, but again, seeing something in such a low form factor with you know, modulations capabilities built into it, uh, directly up to 1.5 gigahertz, is a very nice entry point for a lot of applications in the IoT domain, you know, above 900 megahertz or so. So they, of course, marry this directly with their spectrum analyzers. And it's, uh, it's a good thing to check out. I'm going to see if I can uh, potentially get something to review from them as well, so we can take it apart and see what's going on inside. But uh, it's nice. More competition, the better for the consumers. And here I am at TDK Lambda. Of course, they make some of the world's best power supplies. If you ever open a very high-end test equipment, there's no doubt you'll find a TDK Lambda power supply in there. This is one of their newest products that's just on the market. This is a one UI tall uh, chassis mountable power supply at an incredibly high power density. You can get five kilowatts from these units, configured, of course, through a variety of voltage configurations. Uh, it has built-in arbitrary waveform generators to be able to do ramps and slew rate control and even apply a couple of hundred hertz of various uh, arbitrary waveforms to the power supply to do testing, of course, on whatever it is that you're doing. It also has a three-phase input that's internationally compatible across the globe, so you don't have to worry about changing your voltages or transformers when you switch to this. Now, having five kilowatt at a one, UI, a one U unit like this means you can, of course, stack them and get more, but com the combination of power density, flexibility of input voltage, arbitrary waveform generation is going to make this a very nice addition to your test and measurement instrument. And here I'm at the Lakeshore Cryogenics. We're looking at a, a cryogenic station, essentially. So what this allows you to do is to go down to, to temperatures as low as about 2.5 Kelvin and study the behavior of various devices and materials directly under that temperature. Of course, you can create a vacuum, and there will be a transparent window which you can look at the device under test there. Once you go down to those temperatures, then materials start to do some really interesting things. So if you're doing device physics, you'd find out what happens at those temperatures so you can develop a process associated with that. Nowadays, though, it is very interesting to do quantum computing and quantum effects in silicon. So a lot of times, people actually build their ASICs. They put them in there. They go under the vacuum, under low cryogenic temperatures. And you can route your RF and DC signals out of this chamber, which is under vacuum, with connectors of uh, fairly high frequency. And then you can do full tests under those conditions. Magnetic field can be applied to the device under test. And then, of course, that's a pretty important e effect on quantum physics, especially in, in semiconductors. And you can see the different energy levels that particles will jump to and do your measurements directly under that. It's a fairly compact and, and a neat solution. Sits on probe stations, supports a variety of other uh, interfaces and external vendors to add to it. A nice compact solution from Lakeshore Cryogenics. So here I'm at Focus Microwave, and I want to show you a really neat setup they have here. So these are tuners that they are connected directly to the probes. Now, typically what you want to do, if you want to do a load pool analysis, you're going to need a tuner connected to an output of an amplifier so you can analyze the behavior of the amplifier at various loads. Now, if you want to do that on a probe station, that's a pretty big problem because what you would have to do is you'd have to take a cable from the probe itself all the way to the tuner, which typically sits on the side on the table, this large mechanical device. And that means that the losses of the cable and the interface to the tuner itself is always going to be in front of your tuner. So no matter how much uh, capability the tuner has, you're going to be limited by the losses of those systems, especially once you get to frequencies in the 100 and 110 gigahertz. So what Focus has done here is they've created this ultra compact tuner that sits directly on the probe, eliminating any interface losses and mismatches between your device under test and the tuner itself. So then you can basically cover essentially all of the smith chart. You can see over here that they have ran this whole thing and covering everything. So now in the era of when people are trying to build ultra high efficiency 5G um, PAs for these high performance phased arrays, if you don't have a good load pool system to understand whether your PA is optimum, even 1 dB of gain you would get back from having a tuner like this on your setup is, is huge on the link margin. So it's a really neat, it's the first time I've ever seen something like this connected to probes directly on the station. Definitely check them out if you're in the PA design. This is going to be a vital thing for optimizing your device under test.
So here I am at Sage Millimeter Incorporated, and they have a couple of interesting new products that I want to show you. So first of all, they have this rather unusual coaxial to waveguide transition. And the purpose of this is to interface with standard packages that typically have a coaxial output. So if you look over here, you can see a very small pin coming out. This is normally connected to something that would translate to a coax, maybe a V connector or a K connector of some kind. And what this would allow you to do, without having to re-engineer the entire waveguide transition by yourself, you just add one of these directly to the output of this amplifier, and all of a sudden what you have is now a waveguide transition. What comes out is now waveguide. You don't have to redesign the connector. And what's also clever is that these things can be hermetically sealed. And because this interface, this pin is hermetically sealed, you don't have to redesign this for hermetic seal again. This is already going to be there. So this addition of connecting these transitions to these packages will significantly reduce the design and the cost of bringing a waveguide module to market because you already have this as a standard, which is a very clever idea. So here's uh, another category of connectors as well. So typically you can do waveguide, like this, to coaxial connector. Now if you want to cover all the way up to 110 gigahertz, you're going to obviously need a one millimeter connector. The cost of these connectors, the fragile nature of them, and the cost of the cables is quite high. But a lot of people are working in E-band frequency ranges, up to about 90 gigahertz. There's no really needs, need for using a one millimeter connector if you don't have to. So Sage has developed this brand new transition, a brand new connector type, which is 1.35 millimeter. That works up to about 99 gigahertz and works very well at 90 gigahertz. So they're developing an entire new range of products, transitions from one millimeter to 1.35, cables that are already in 1.35 millimeter to basically open up this whole space for much um, cheaper, these kind of transitions directly from Waveguide, which is also very interesting. You should check their website to see these kind of transitions. It may save you a lot of money and allow you to have a whole ecosystem of cheaper connectors and cables to replace the one millimeter ones you have. So here I'm at Semiprobe, and I want to show you one of their latest innovations and probe stations they have. This is a semi-automatic probe station, SA6. It's actually running under some, emulating some tests. Now some of the interesting features of this probe station is that aside from being lower cost than some of the competitors, is that this is a completely modular system. So say you buy an 8-inch station, and then you've done all your 8-inch testing, and eventually you move into a 12-inch CMOS wafer that you need to test, you can remove the chuck, upgrade it, and they will give you a 12-inch chuck with the new travel that will support that. All of these uh, different uh, manipulators that you see attached are currently magnetically connected. This magnetic coupling of different probes to the probe station is an attractive solution because it gives you complete flexibility of how you want to attach these, especially for complex DC measurements, and you just lock them down with magnetic locks. Now, of course, when you go to millimeter wave uh, testing, when you have a long extension, you're going to have to have something that's a little bit more flexible. So in this case, you have a bolt-in module. You can see this is a millimeter wave extension or tuner or whatever you may be testing that can get directly bolted onto the probe station. And in that case, what you'll have is something that has the mechanical stability to absorb the vibration and the weight, the mass of those uh, big modules are there. So Semiprobe is going to offer some good competitive solution to what's already on the market. This is actually a fairly competitive area. So the more modular you are and the more upgradable uh, features you have in the future is going to be a more attractive solution since these things do cost a lot initially. And here on the right side, you can see the computer screen on the right where there's a camera that shows you that the probe station is traveling. You can do a test. You can uh, characterize everything, do a log, and record everything. These are all the features, of course, available to all different probe station vendors. But definitely take a look at Semiprobe, some of the uh, customization capabilities capability and price point, you may be uh, surprised to find this is exactly what you need. So here I am at the Sayer booth, and they have a brand new set of network analyzers that I want to show you. So these guys offer some impressive specification. This is a 20 gigahertz model, but they do have a 67 gigahertz model on four channels. With this thing, have a typically about 132 dB of dynamic range, you know, 42 dB of power control range on them. So fairly competitive uh, with some of the other you know, best-in-class instruments that you see on the market. Now, although I haven't tested one of these myself, maybe we'll get an opportunity to do this at some point. But it's good to keep in mind that even, even at 67 gigahertz, the, the market is competitive, allowing uh, the various vendors come in. This is a, a, a Chinese manufacturer that has this uh, product obviously up to 67 gigahertz, but they also offer 8.4 gigahertz, 6 gigahertz versions of this at much, much lower cost, 4 port, 2 port version. So a really comprehensive uh, set of configurations that are available. I checked them out on their website. I'm going to show you a couple of other things they make here. Uh, it's uh, really quite interesting to see. Uh, I had never seen this um, brand before, so I'm very eager to see if I can get my hand on and we do some proper teardown and testing in the lab. 
And here we have another sort of product. This is the signal and spectrum analyzer. And as you can see, even these ones get, can go all the way up to 67 gigahertz, coming in a variety of models, as you would expect from different vendors. Uh, this one has an internal built-in analysis capability, of course, because this is a spectrum analyzer as well as a signal analyzer. Built in the software, similar to the demodulation products you would find from other vendors. So you can buy these in different configurations as well. And this is actually coupled with some of their other products, unfortunately they don't have the 67 gigahertz version of this uh, unit here, but they do have vector signal generators that have about 200 megahertz of internal uh, bandwidth as well as, a, uh, according to their data sheet, up to two gigahertz of external modulation capability up to 67 gigahertz, which I believe is fairly unique because I don't think a lot of vendors have that directly built into one of these boxes. So we have to do some proper testing on these, but these are some of the very, very competitive and state-of-the-art instruments uh, that you can find here. And here, two more things I wanted to show you. They do have, of course, just a normal spectrum analyzer. This one's up to uh, 44 gigahertz. I can see nice, gigantic screen. Easy to use, you know, reasonably good uh, GUI interface here. I haven't really played around with it too much. But they also have, of course, oscilloscopes. Uh, this one is a uh, digital phosphor oscilloscope, similar with the persistence coloring and so on. Five giga sample per second, 500 megahertz for channel. I'm sure it works very well. Uh, but I would love to get my hand on some of these and so we can do some proper comparison and see how these state-of-the-art instruments coming from overseas here uh, compete with some of the, you know, Roden Schwartz and Key sites that have been making these units for a very long time. But these are really, really competitive, and I'm really eager to see how well they perform.